Meanwhile, the Hamas attack on the music festival in southern Israel, you know it killed 260 people. It left so many others wounded. But we are now hearing incredible stories of survival. This is from people who attended that very festival. Natalie Sanandaji of Great Neck, Long Island, she was there when she literally ran for her life when rockets began flying overhead. Yesterday, she went to Washington to tell her frightening story to members of Congress. All right, this morning, Natalie is here with us on Good Day New York. Thank God. You're safe and sound. I'm sure your family must be so happy that you're home. Yeah, they're definitely relieved to have me home. Okay, so what happened? You went to Israel for a friend's wedding, yep. and you were looking forward to this concert. It's something that you were planning to go to. Yes. Describe that day. Is it very, first of all, I should ask you, is it okay to ask you to describe what happened? Yes, honestly, I feel that possibly as a response to the trauma, I feel a bit detached from the situation, but I think it gives me the power to tell my story over and over again without breaking down. So mm -hmm. it is okay, I can go into detail about it. At around 6.30, I was at the festival. I was one of the only the only Americans from all of my friend group there. Everyone else was Israeli. One of the girls had come up to me to explain to me that some rockets had been intercepted overhead. She was very calm about the situation. She said that it's normal for the area that we're in. This happens sometimes. It might just be a few, and then hopefully the party will continue. Try to imagine anywhere else in the world where a festival is going on and young kids see rockets intercepted over their heads and they think, oh, it's fine. That wouldn't really happen anywhere else in the world, but this is a reality for most Israeli citizens. They've been in bomb shelters countless times in their life. After a few minutes, we obviously realized this isn't just any other ordinary situation. The rockets just kept coming and kept coming. Eventually, the security of the festival had turned off the music, asked everyone to evacuate to their cars. As we're evacuating to our cars, we still had no idea that there were terrorists on foot so close to us with guns. We thought it was just rockets. I decided to go to the bathrooms by the, the festival exit area before we went to our car. A few days ago, I saw a video surface of the terrorists going to those exact bathrooms and just shooting at every bathroom stall, trying to kill anyone who was inside. That was one of the hardest videos for me to see since surviving this massacre because I was in those bathrooms moments before. Mm. And if I was there moments later, I might not be here today. Mm. After we got to our cars, the festival security tried to get everyone to safety to the best of their ability. Most of them died doing so. Eventually, they asked everyone to pull their cars over and get out of their cars and run. And at first, we couldn't understand why until we first heard the first gunshots. And that's when we realized that being in our cars and being in such a condensed area with so many cars made us a very easy target for the terrorists. We got out of our cars as soon as we heard the first gunshots. We started to run. Nobody knew what direction to run in. Nobody knew what direction was the direction of safety. Kids were running in every direction. One of the most terrifying things was running in a certain direction, thinking that I'm running to safety, and then seeing dozens of children running in my direction, mm. realizing that they're running from a terrorist, they're running from being shot at, oh, no. and I now have to make a split-second decision and run in another direction and try to save my own life. Talk to us about once you felt like you finally got to a place where maybe you could be safe. Did you feel any relief at all? Honestly, it took about four hours until yeah. we got to safety. At a certain point while we were running, I remember passing by a ditch with maybe 10, 15 kids hiding in it, and they told me and my friends to come hide with them, and we almost did until one of my friends said, if we hide in this ditch and the terrorists come from above us, we have nowhere to run. Yeah. We ended up deciding to continue running, and we later found out that all the kids who hid in that ditch mm -hmm. did get sh oh. shot and killed. After about four hours of running, we decided to sit under a tree, get some shade. We've been running in the sun for hours with no water. A white pickup truck is driving in our direction, and we're sitting with about 10, 15 other kids, and we were, I remember looking at everyone, and we all kind of, our first reaction was thinking, this is this a terrorist person, yeah. coming to kill us. Yeah. And we kind of all like half got up and then realized, where are we going to run to? We have nowhere to go. And we kind of all just like sat back down and accepted our fate. If this is a terrorist, then that's it. This is the end. Thankfully enough, 
It wasn't. It was a man from the nearby town of Patish, which is the town that we were told to run to. He left the safety of his town and he came towards all of this, wow. risking his own life to save innocent children. I never even got to thank him. We all got into the back of his pickup truck. He dropped us off in his town. And as soon as he dropped us off, he turned right back around yeah. to risk his life all over again to save more kids. And I, I wish I could thank him. But. You can. You have the opportunity right now to say what you want to say to him, to someone that, that risked their life to help save yours. If he's seeing this right now, then I just want to say thank you because if it wasn't for him, I probably wouldn't be here today. Wow. What did you want members of Congress to know yesterday? And what was that experience like? Um, it was quite surreal. I never thought I would be in such a position speaking to people with so much power. And I just want them to know how much Israel needs their support right now. Mm. That our enemy... Did you talk to the president? Is that you and the president? I can't say. Uh, no, I spoke to um, uh, the second uh, gentleman. Okay. Um, so what I wanted them to know was how much Israel needs their support and how much Israel's enemy is also America's enemy. We're fighting against a terrorist organization mm. that is being supported by other terrorist organizations that have attacked U.S. soil in the past. Mm. And from speaking to them, I think most of them understand that, and I, I think that most of them are there for Israel and are going yeah. to support Israel. Natalie, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story. I'm sure your family is so happy that you're back. Yes. We're happy that you're back, thank too. Thank you. Thank you for Safe having me. Safe and sound, and prayers to everybody. Thank you. Who I, you were there with. And I know prayers to a lot of people that are back, but they're going back to Israel. Even a lot of my friends who survived this massacre have now re-enlisted in the army to fight for their country and are risking their lives all over again. Yeah. And Natalie, I just pray for them. Yeah. Natalie Sanandaji, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Thank, thank you for having me.